Well, hello everyone and happy Monday and welcome to another episode of You've Got the Power. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Deitch, and of course we are here with Dr. Chris Centeno, Chief Medical Officer of the Centeno Schultz Clinic in Broomfield, Colorado. Happy Monday, Dr. Centeno. Happy Monday, Jason. Today is a uh, sort of open show, open format. If you're watching and you uh, normally tune in, you know we normally kick it off with a specific topic specific subject. Uh, but today, guess what? You get to ask your questions. Anything goes Q&A today. Uh, so if you're watching and you've got questions, now is your time to ask. I will begin with the first question, of course. Uh, Dr. Centeno, you know, you spend, many people don't know, but you spend, uh, you know, all of your weeks, your day job uh, in the clinic, working with real people, real problems, providing them real solutions. Uh, so let me kick off today's conversation by asking uh, what's been happening in clinic that uh, would be interesting for a lot of us to know. Yeah, you know, a story from last week, I think, would illustrate some interesting points. Uh, you know, we do upper cervical facet injections. Uh, the, the neck has various joints, C0, C1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, et cetera, going down. And uh, those two top joints, the 0, 1, and the 1, 2, are particularly technically difficult to inject and regrettably very few interventional pain physicians therefore inject them. And the topmost one, zero one, uh, is very, very commonly injured or hurts in patients with craniocervical instability. But to inject that joint safely, you need something that's called DSA or digital subtraction angiography. And, uh, that's actually a technology that's an expensive bolt-on to a CRM fluoroscope. And because it's expensive, most clinics don't purchase it, or most ambulatory surgery centers that have these machines don't purchase it. But you know, it's a, it's a critical component to make sure that you're in the artery or not. And the artery we're talking about here is the vertebral artery, the one that supplies blood to the back of the brain. So injecting something bad into that vertebral artery would mean a posterior circulation stroke. Um, and so this last week, we had to use that DSA, or digital subtraction angiography feature, to make sure that we weren't getting any vascular flow during this C0, C1 injection. Turned out we weren't, but we can see that clearly because what this does is it subtracts out the background. So all you see is what's moving, uh, in this case, the contrast. And if the contrast were going to a vessel, it would you know, trace the course of the vessel. If the contrast were going into just the joint, it just traces the course of the joint. So it's, a, it's an expensive add-on that costs about $20,000, $25,000 to add on to a floral machine. We've had it uh, on all of our floral machines just because of the kind of work we do. But many clinics don't have this and don't have the ability to see if they're injecting inadvertently into one of these critical uh, arteries up in that area. So it's just another example of all the different things we do to try to keep people safe. There, there's no such thing as 100% safety. There's no such thing as a procedure with 0% complications, but you certainly can take a lot of precautions to try to up your odds of keeping patients safe. I'd love to dig a little bit deeper as we're waiting for more questions. Uh, again, today is Anything Goes. Ask your questions to Dr. Centeno. I'm going to kick it off while a lot of viewers uh, join us. Um, but I think, you know, what you brought up, I, I think, is fascinating because, you know, many of the viewers that come or many of the people that hear from other viewers to learn more uh, don't really know the difference of what happens at the Centeno Schultz Clinic versus uh, you know, what can I get more conveniently that's either more local uh, and or covered by my insurance? Um, and so, you know, you bring up a great point. Help people understand, uh, one, are doctors trained to use this, but oftentimes don't purchase it because, you know, of the financial inability to recoup the costs? Are they not trained in it because it's such a rare and unique diagnosis that, you know, that's just not their specialty or help people get a, a sense of the landscape out there as to kind of why you do excel, both in terms of the skill set, knowledge and investment in technology 
to really be expert in these particular categories uh, compared to those that may call themselves experts but don't really back it up with the training and the technology that's necessary. Yeah, so this digital subtraction and geography or DSA is really, um, it's a highly specialized thing. It would be normally used by uh, cardiologists uh, in order to be able to see uh, contrasts go into an artery when you may not be able to see the artery because of all of the overlying bone. So it's primarily used by uh, interventional cardiologists who do those sorts of injections or sometimes interventional radiologists. Uh, as far as we're con you know, concerned, realize that when it comes to those zero one injections, there's only about a hundred US physicians that have done maybe a dozen or two dozen or more of those procedures. And if we go to the number of US physicians that have done a hundred of them, that list narrows to maybe one or two dozen physicians in the US and the US would have done more of these procedures than anywhere else on earth by far, meaning uh, just because the U.S. has much more sophisticated interventional spine care than other countries. Uh, so it's a very rarefied group of doctors that are even doing and attempting this injection very often. You know, we have a lot of prolotherapists that will make the claim that they inject this area. There's one in Chicago and Florida that's doing that, uh, but they're not injecting this joint. Uh, that's just a claim and, and without much reality. And I think that's one of the things to, to understand is that some of these procedures uh, take a lot of technical know-how. They take a lot of machinery and other things to do safely. And then obviously they take a lot of experience like anything else. If you do something 10 times, you're not real good at it. You do something 100 times, you're a bit better at it. You do something 1,000 times, you're an expert at it. So that's sort of the problem here is that uh, even if you had a DSA package on your fluoroscopy machine, uh, the vast majority of physicians who do interventional spine injections wouldn't really have any experience in injecting this particular joint. And that's what makes the Centeno Schultz difference. We are getting questions, so let's get right into them. Here we go. This one comes from T.O. Kyles, who asks, uh, is it a is is research is there research for a treatment for COVID with stem cells or PRP? Um, you know, there's I kind of got out of looking at COVID uh, about six months ago just because it was so politically contentious. You know, my job was to look at all of that information and to try to uh, really not approach it politically, but approach it scientifically. Uh, and regrettably, everyone else, including the mass media, was generally approaching COVID politically. Uh, you know, back then, uh, there were several promising studies out of Asia using mesenchymal stem cells, not the kind of stuff that you can get here in the United States, meaning this is not something that you can get done here, uh, with some promise. So I haven't really updated myself on that research since then, since I really stopped looking at COVID, COVID treatments, COVID diagnosis, et cetera. But back then there were several studies that were promising out of Asia, but the products they were using were not available here in the United States at this time. All righty. T.O., thank you for your question. Let's move to Ilmas Ashraf, who asks, uh, are there any trials going on uh, to make stem cells more powerful or more effective? Um, yeah, there's a few different concepts out there. So for instance, one of the things that we do in Grand Cayman uh, is we will select out cells that can survive the harsh environment inside the intervertebral disc uh, through conditioning the cells in culture. That's one way to make the cells more effective for that clinical application. Uh, there are other things out there like trying to genetically change cells. And uh, that's very much still in the research phases, uh, trying to um, artificially select certain cells within a group of cells. Uh, again, still very much in the research uh, in the research phase. 
And then there are simple things that you can do, like adding adjuvants to the cells, like high-dose platelet-rich plasma or other things that will help the cells do their work, and or improve the ground or the, uh, the, the fertility of the ground in which you plant them. And that would be improving the patient's health uh, or maximizing or optimizing the patient's health as best you can before doing this kind of procedure. You know, that's exactly where I was going to go with you on that as well. Is uh, It seems that we're always trying to find something and make it better. Um, but when you're talking about the body and the body's ability to heal itself using uh, its own, you know, body-made M cells, blood, PRP, et cetera, uh, I guess my question is, uh, do you believe stem cells need to be more powerful? I mean, uh, don't they have a tremendous amount of power and ability and capability uh, as they are? Um, I guess I get my question to some degree following up, just being curious is, um, you know, do they really need to be improved or what holds them back from getting the results that many people would like them to get? Is it a matter of making them more powerful or is it more of a, uh, you know, if a person patient isn't very healthy, therefore that's going to limit their own stem cells from reaching their own potential and therefore making it really more about the person and their overall health and less about maybe manipulating a specific stem cell or a specific technology. I hope I'm asking that right. Yeah, listen, I mean, for the vast majority of what we're asking them to do, uh, they work uh, just fine. Now, there might be some clinical indications where you might want to do certain things to the cells. Uh, you might want to add certain things to the cells, et cetera. And there's some simple things that, that we can do uh, using, your, using your stem cells that are safe, like we can dramatically increase the dose of those cells and concentration of those cells. We can add in high dose PRP. So lots of different things can be done uh, already. And uh, you know, for the odd patient you need help, uh, we can take that patient down to Grand Cayman where we can culture the cells to get more, where we can make changes to the cells in the culture uh, itself. But for the most part, you know, there's not a big need to change them at this point. I would agree. I would agree. Moving on to our next question. This is from Grove Higgins. Great guy. Uh, awesome to see you, Dr. Centeno. Uh, I am a referring doctor to you and your group. I have had several patients want or seek out of country stem cell therapies. Uh, and his question is, what's the difference between what you all do and those offerings? Uh, and also, what are the potential risks? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, the, the biggest concern that I have always had about out-of-country stem cell therapies is um, the, the local yokel effect. And what I mean by the local yokel effect is that in a small Caribbean country like Grand Cayman, uh, there's a need for physicians uh, to migrate there. So they incentivize physicians to get their licenses. So, you know, the vast majority of physicians practicing down in Grand Cayman come from the U.S. and Canada, where they're very, very well trained. Uh, there's very, very few that are educated on the island for obvious reasons. It's a small island. Uh, when you get into Central uh, America and South America, you have what I call the local yokel effect. Same thing happens in Mexico. It's impossible to get a license down there for a U.S. physician because the local doctors who are definitely more poorly trained than U.S. doctors don't want it uh, because they certainly know that if a U.S. doctor comes down there, the patient would preferentially want to see a U.S. doctor and not a local doctor. So it, it's really a, uh, an interesting concept because you kind of have to deal with the local yokel. So you go down there, you start a clinic, and you can't have these expert US doctors treat your patients. The patients must be treated by whatever is available to you locally. So there's a huge step down, especially for what we do in interventional spine and uh, interventional orthopedics from here to there uh, to begin with. And then you also get into other issues like um, how do I know where the cells come from? So if these are umbilical cord cells, we tried to do this in China a number of years ago 
uh, we had opened up a clinic in China and you know, we were just doing research on trying to figure out where their umbilical cord cells that, that other clinics were using came from. And we couldn't find this out at all. Um, in fact, you know, we had contacts at very high levels and they didn't know either, you know, were these properly sourced? Were they uh, actually uh, tested for communicable diseases, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on. And the answer was no one really knew. Um, so the other problem I think I'd have with going to a third world country in order to try to get one of these treatments would be that effect, meaning that there are many, many things that happen in third world countries that don't happen in first world countries, meaning first world countries like the US, like Canada, and very much like Grand Cayman because of their banking, you, you really can't pay someone off very easily. Uh, it attracts a lot of attention and negative attention, and it's very hard to do, so it's just not done. Uh, you just don't see that happen very often here in the United States, but in, in, in Latin America, it's pretty common. Uh, and it's almost part of, of the way things are done. Uh, so you've got a training issue and the doctor, obviously, there are other concerns down there. So we have uh, stayed with our Grand Cayman Clinic where we can control those things, where we can culture expand cells. Um, and then what's generally done in those places, usually umbilical cord type cells are used. And again, we don't have enough research on that cell type to know uh, the safety of what's going on down there. So, you know, you might see these clinics because these clinics will pay some guy to get on social media and some wrestler or some other guy to talk about what a great uh, outcome he or she had. You know, they're fairly aggressive marketers, but uh, I wouldn't be sending my friends there um, for all the reasons I discussed. Let's just clarify for uh, Grove. Uh, again, great guy, Grove. It's great to thank you for joining us and thank you for sending people to the Centeno Schultz Clinic. Um, you, if I understand Dr. Centeno, uh, so I can explain it clearly, offer what I'll call the best of both worlds. Uh, you've got a clinic in obviously Broomfield, but you also have an affiliated clinic down in the Grand Cayman. So if somebody was looking for those sort of out of the country type procedures, um, they actually would probably be best working with you here and then maybe, if necessary, going to your clinic in the Grand Caymans. Does that sound right as to what Dr. Higgins would want to recommend to his patients? Yeah, listen, uh, if we need to see uh, these patients and they need more cells or things done to the cells that we can't do here in the United States, it's easy enough for us to take a patient down there um, so yes, um, you know, there's really no reason to, for us to utilize any other, uh, facility other than the licensed facility that we have in Grand Cayman, uh, simply because, you know, we can control all the parts and pieces there. I know what happens there. I know the lab staff, I know what they're doing. They're using our SOPs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I can't control those same things at a Latin American clinic where, again, monkey business is kind of just part of the game. Part of the game and healthcare is a crazy game. Grove, thank you for your question. And again, thank you for your referrals. Appreciate it a lot. Uh, Ilmas has another question. It says, surgery is a hundred year old procedure, barbaric. Other countries like China are getting far ahead. Why the US is not leading up? Why the FDA is banning research on different types of stem cells? Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I, I would certainly say that uh, this is uh, based on the regulatory decisions made overall. Um, the U.S. is falling behind in this part of biotechnology. Um, so that's that is a problem. I think that, you know, we're seeing other countries not put those same barriers in place. And when it comes to practical experience in biotechnology, they're they're getting ahead. Uh, the big con the, the big equalizer there is still you know the US NIH, which you know funds far far more research uh, than China can, than you know the Europe can, et cetera. Meaning that you know US NIH, as you saw with the whole COVID thing and coronavirus, you know, definitely 
has more than enough money where it gives some money to researchers in other countries. Uh, the amount of money spent in those other countries on basic science research generally doesn't approach anything even close to what the NIH spends uh, here on behalf of Americans. So on the one hand, we're getting a bit behind in practical applications. On the other hand, you know, we're still the research leader uh, out there. Uh, I'm going to follow up with his question before I go to the other, uh, which is, what's your perception of the influence the pharmaceutical industry has here in the U.S. versus China, and what impact that might have on suppressing United States stem cell research or any type of natural orthobiologic research versus, uh, I'll say, the pharma and medical device industry uh, that oftentimes wants to keep the status quo, uh, not necessarily lead an innovation of more natural forms of healing. Yeah, you know, uh, I think there is a uh, there is pressure from the pharmaceutical industry not to uh, move things along that might be commercialized by the pharmaceutical industry. So I think that's part of what we see here in the United States of why there's been so much so much regulatory pushback uh, overall. Having said that, you know I have to also look at this through the lens of uh, of being a physician who has seen how crazy things have gotten here. And, um, you know, with uh, lots of, you know, small little alternative medicine clinics believing that they're injecting umbilical cord stem cells when they're actually injecting dense dead cells, where untrained providers are doing these procedures just to try to, to make money, where you got an acupuncture clinic hooking someone up to an IV, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So on the, other, on the other hand, you know, we're in a situation where even with what the FDA is doing, it's a shit show out there. Uh, and, you know, the stem cell wild west, as I call it, is really, really frightening. So, you know, I see it from both sides of that fence. Clearly, we could have done a better job with our regula regulations and ignoring the pressure from big pharma. Uh, on the other hand, even with all the regulations, we still have a lot of crazy stuff going on. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's it's the Wild West. So you do have to, I guess, buyer beware. And that is exactly why we do this program is so you can ask your questions. You can, uh, you know, compare your your responses from Dr. Centeno with anyone else for that matter and really come to your conclusions as to what you think is best. That is the point of you got the power. Let's go on to Ben Robertson, who says, hi, Dr. Centeno. What is your general advice with regard to activity post PICL? I'm over six weeks out, and I'm worried that I may have disrupted some of the ligament healing with lifting, arm movements, and being too active. Surely, if I haven't re-injured my neck, I should be okay. And that's a question. Thanks. Yeah, so one of the things to realize is that there's really no easy way for us to uh, take all the pressure off those upper cervical ligaments while they heal. We could put you in a brace. But interestingly enough, about half, 40% to 50% of craniocervical instability patients can't tolerate a brace. So that would also be interesting. But let's say you would be in that 60% who likes being in a brace. Uh, if you're in that 60% who likes being in a brace, if we put you in a brace, regrettably, all those upper cervical muscles that are holding things together get dramatically weaker. And that's the other half of the instability equation, meaning that half of it is ligaments, half of it is muscles. So at the end of the day, uh, we can't brace you. Uh, now, what we can do is to say, listen to your body closely. So if you start to do something that is ramping up your neck, back off of what that is. And the reason why we put it that way is people's recoveries are vastly different. Some of our low level patients, for instance, would have a hard time lifting anything at all. Uh, other patients can lift things. And we even have patients that are working out. So obviously you would have three different then uh, recommendations for those three different disparate levels of patient activity and function. So uh, generally we don't see people injuring these ligaments with doing things like simple lifting. Now, if you're telling me that you didn't, hadn't done any lifting in years and you start, started to feel better and you started to lift heavy things, 
then that's definitely something that could cause an issue. But if you're just telling me that you went and did your normal daily activities that you would normally be able to do, uh, I'm not concerned about that. All right. And are there any things that uh, Ben should sort of watch for based on your experience pattern-wise? Should, you know, maybe feel a symptom flare-up, but it should normalize over a period of time, six weeks out, or uh, just keep listening to his body and, and, you know, I guess when you say, we say pain means to pay attention inside now. And that's really the message is, uh, you know, not to just follow a formula beyond your body does communicate with you. And if you're listening, uh, even especially to the whisper and what your body is leaning you to, you know, rest or be active, you'll tend to be able to modulate your activity individually better than otherwise. Is that, is there anything he should be looking for in particular to be a red flag or a, a, a sign that everything is okay? No, you know, that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much it. And I think what you had said is listen closely or listen to the whisper. You know, for instance, I had injured my back uh, a number of weeks ago, and that recovery was very much threading the needle between trying to stay active, but listening carefully to what was going on with my back. And, um, you know, the good news is I was able to stay active. Um, really, in the end, for about a week, I was at about 75% of my normal activity level. Um, so it only dropped at 25%. That means that one day I didn't do anything uh, where I was supposed to. The next day I did maybe half of what I was supposed to. The next day I did three quarters. The next day I did full. Um, but just realize that you know threading that needle and understanding how to do that is a critical part of recovery because you have to stay as active as you can uh, but you also have to listen to what your body's telling you. So, for instance, if we take an animal who has hurt a joint and we immobilize that animal, the healing is worse, not better. Uh, and if you watch the way a dog recovers after surgery, they go down hard for a couple days, but then they're right back up and doing as much as they're able to do and they feel able to do relatively quickly. So we're all built to heal on the fly. This idea that we need to do nothing while we're healing is not grounded in science. That is a, a great point. Uh, and just to bring that point home, you know, the message is listen to your body. Uh, and oftentimes people tend to want to pay attention to their obligations or responsibilities above listening to their body. Thus, the need for painkillers and other types of artificial ways to disconnect your ability to actually listen to what your body is trying to communicate with you. Your dog or all animal examples uh, are very much like that. Not to say that they're not appropriate in some cases, but it does interfere with your ability to actually listen to what your body is trying to communicate with you in terms of its needs. Uh, just like hunger, just like needing to go to sleep, just like needing to go to the bathroom, our bodies communicate with us. We just need to do a better job learning how to listen to what it is that we need. So um, let's move on with questions. Thank you very much for your question, Ben. Hopefully that helped. And hopefully you are continuing to improve as we would like to see. This is from Justin Eddy. Hi, Dr. Centeno. Thanks for everything. You said in a live stream several months ago that the efficacy of the PICL has been improved and may continue to be improved by advancements in the technique used during the injections. I know one of the improvements in the technique is the addition of the above below C1 injections. Are there other ways the technique has improved and are you working on or thinking about any improvements for the future? Yeah, you know, um, consider this graph as something that kind of goes like this. You know, there's rapid improvements. And then at some point you get to the point where the improvements start to level off over time, whether they're still happening. And then at some point you get to the point where they level off more and more that kind of adoption curve. So at the end of the day, um, at this point, I think we're 95% done with uh, changes to the PICL. Uh, the addition of uh, going above the Atlas uh, was a big one that we started messing with about two years ago and then started or at least I did start messing with it about two years ago. And then over time, it's become more routine um, in doing that. But, uh, but I don't think there's going to be major changes 
going forward. I think we've got about 95% of those currently baked into the procedure. Uh, there's some other small changes we might make here or there that might improve um, the procedure for certain patients uh, who are still a struggle based on their anatomy. Um, so that kind of thing may change, but I don't see major changes happening in the procedure going forward right now. All righty. That was a great question. Thank you very much, Justin, and thanks for uh, following up and for tuning in. We've got a follow-up from Ilmas who says that the uh, FDA uh, equals funding and drug administration. Um, so uh, different ways of, I, I'll say, satirizing uh, the insanity going on in our healthcare system. So uh, FDA can probably sound for, stand for a lot of different things. <laughs> Uh, let's go to something submitted previously in advance by Sherry Golden. Uh, sending in a question just in case you do one today. Is your clinic the only location that does the PICL? If so, is any kind of a medical visa needed to be treated when coming from Europe? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we've had uh, we've had at least one clinic in Europe who has claimed to be doing a similar procedure. They're not. Um, they don't have the training to do this particular uh, procedure. They don't have the equipment necessary to do this procedure. Uh, they don't even have the lab necessary to do this procedure. So we're starting to see some copycats kind of uh, pop up. But yes, uh, the, our clinic is the only clinic uh, that performs uh, this procedure. Uh, we're the only one that are doing research on this procedure. We're the only one that have the equipment to do this procedure. Uh, for example, we have 3D specialized mouth pieces that we've uh, 3D printed, and we've got about three major different types and about 10 different sizes that are used uh, to accommodate patients and to make sure we can get where we need to go. We have, in addition to that, endoscopy, which is not something that you would usually find in our kind of clinic. That's an endoscope where you actually can see the area you're injecting. You can clean off that area. We have a CGMP clean room. Uh, where the cells are processed because an infection in this area would be a really big problem for a patient. Um, and none of, those other th none of those things can be found outside of our clinic, uh, especially those 3D printed mouthpieces since we, we made those ourselves um, for our own uh, use. So um, yeah, there is no other place. As far as visas are concerned, um, I don't think you would need a visa to, to come to the U.S. from mo from most countries unless it's on some sort of list. Uh, maybe China, for example, requires a visa. There may be COVID restrictions and other things that that happen, um, and that may all depend on where things are with Delta and whether or not Delta burns itself out, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to uh, locations where this can be done, yes, it's it's Colorado only at this juncture. All righty. Thank you, Sherry, for your question in advance. Our next one is from Gabby Ramos. She says, hi, Dr. Centeno. How soon after PICL procedure would it be okay to get into a hyperbaric oxygen, oxygen chamber? Are the stem cells too fragile to get in immediately? No, that, that would be no problem. So if you wanted to go into uh, hyperbaric oxygen, you'd, uh, I'd be just fine with that. That's, that's not a problem at all. All right. So, I mean, uh, immediately, uh, as soon as you could, that's not a problem. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you for your question. Ben Robertson follows up. Do you have any plans to expand and teach the PICL procedure to Regenix providers in Europe? Uh, a lot of patients from Europe with CCI struggled to travel to Colorado and was wondering whether you think in the future this could happen. I know Algo cells in the UK do upper cervical posterior injections. Thanks. Yeah. The biggest problem with all of that would be, there's a couple dimensions to that. The first dimension is simple. Like I said, there's, there's a lot of specific equipment that goes into doing the PICL procedures that these clinics don't have. So today we talked about the digital subtraction and geography or DSA package. Uh, we've talked about the 3D printed mouthpieces. There's three different types in multiple different sizes to make sure that we can get where we need to go. Um, you know, we're certainly allowed to make those for our own use, but we're not allowed to sell those uh, to another clinic. So that clinic would have to develop their own set of 3D printed mouthpieces 
to to do this um, because you know we've got no desire to sell them or to jump through the hoops necessary to to sell them. Then you've got endoscopy, which is being able to see exactly where you are at all times. And then you've got finally the biggest problem I have, and that is as we're doing this procedure, keeping what's done and how it's done uh, tightly controlled is critical because we need to get to a couple thousand of these cases and publish a few papers before we can really say that we're at that place where we can teach others. Because all it takes is one or two really bad results because someone didn't really kind of get the memo on what should be done and the procedure goes away. And I'll give you a great example on that. Uh, prolotherapy, you probably all have heard of. Uh, well, the 1940s, prolotherapy was big, also through the 1950s. Uh, orthopedic surgeons were doing prolotherapy. There was a drug um, that was developed to do prolotherapy called Sanusol. But then some prolotherapists uh, actually injected intrathecal into the covering of the spinal cord or nerve roots. Uh, there were some paralysis cases and, uh, and prolotherapy disappeared. Uh, it disappeared for decades until it came back online uh, in the late 1980s, kind of resurrected by a dedicated group of doctors in the Midwest. So that's the kind of thing that happens when you don't control all those parts and pieces and don't get your publications out. Once something's established, you can say, yeah, that's established. It's working really well. Here's the publications. We know the safety profile if you do it right. So now we're ready to start teaching it. But if you do it before then, all it takes are one or two bad results, and this thing will never be done again by anybody. Uh, which would be a huge human tragedy, in my opinion, because that leaves the only thing that could be done as fusion. Uh, as you referenced, this uh, sort of walking the line, threading the needle between wanting to help as many as you can, but wanting to make sure it's safe and effective is always an important uh, line to be walking. So thank you very much for your question, Ben. Uh, a great one. Jim Conlin says, I have tried several times to ask Dr. John Pitts for advice. I'm a former patient. I called the Broomfield, Colorado clinic for advice uh, about my stenosis and two synovial cysts pressuring my L4. Uh, I guess his question is, can somebody please return his calls? The answer will be yes, of course. Uh, is there yeah, but, but yeah, ask, yeah, ask me. I'm happy to answer your, your question. Yeah, Jim, if there's anything you'd like to ask specifically uh, here with Dr. Centeno, uh, I'll be happy to ask your question. Uh, is there anything you want to mention that he's got stenosis? two synovial cysts pressuring on his L4. Yeah, so uh, usually that's a facet cyst. So what that means is that there's swelling in the facet joint, there's a little pocket that poofs out, uh, usually into the spinal canal or close to the nerve roots. Um, and generally what has to be done is either that uh, cyst can be popped through over-injection of the joint um, or if it pops and then returns, sometimes the cyst has to be surgically removed. Um, and, you know, I've had at least one patient who we've popped it, it's come back, we've popped it, it's come back. You know, she's adamant about not getting surgery. And after a number of procedures, we, we've pretty much gotten rid of the cyst and its effects, meaning it's gotten so small, it's not really a day-to-day -day issue. So there are different ways to treat facet cysts. But, you know, just realize that some of them are surgical because you can't get rid of them. Thank you for your question, Jim. And yes, uh, we will get you in touch with uh, Dr. Pitts. Let's move on with Amy Balfour. Could I book a telemedicine consult with you if I send upright MRI imaging? Or should I wait until I get the CD of the CT venogram and, po and post that? after that? Um, you know, we do a lot of, well, listen, you know, that's up to you. We, we may need two visits. Um, if you book that before we uh, have your CT vinogram. Now, uh, a lot of times I don't do that. What will happen instead is, because uh, we do this with DMX all the time, the patient can't get to a DMX 
but they do have an MRI or they do have a flexion extension MRI. So we do the eval, uh, we go through all of the history, everything we can, and then say, you know what, you know, you're probably a candidate for this, but we really need a DMX, but we're gonna get that. And you'll just send that back to Carla, who will then contact me, I'll review it, and I'll let you know, so we don't have to wait more time to get back online together and find a time that works for both of us. So that's generally, I think, how we would do it, is book the eval, and if you don't have that CT venogram, then we can go ahead, get the CT venogram, I can look at it separately, and I can come back and say, hey, this is definitely you know, X or Y. Uh, but it tends to make things go faster if you do it that way, uh, just so that you can get in the queue and we can start figuring out what, what's best for you. And if the CT venogram changes that, you know, we'll obviously let you know. That sounds like a good recommendation. Uh, the last I checked, your schedule was quite booked up. So uh, the sooner somebody can get on it, uh, likely the better. Uh, so that's a good thing. Let's move on to Shenzhen Khan, who asks, what would C7 and T1's spinous processes turn in opposite directions despite being vertically aligned? Thank you. What would um, yeah, I think what, what, well, so I'm assuming what you're saying, I guess there's two conditions and I'm not quite sure which, which we're talking about here. Uh, one would be that one vertebra is turning one way, the other one's turning the other way. Um, you know, that can be due to things like scoliosis, uh, that can be due to things like uh, disc damage, ligament damage, etc. Now, if what you mean is that they're aligned on top of each other, except for the spinous processes, one goes one way, the other one goes the other way, then uh, that can happen due to differential pulls uh, on the muscles that attach to the spinous process and if you pull on a bone long enough and hard enough, the bone will change shape. Um, so the bone will actually morph in that direction. And we definitely see that too. So I'm not sure which of those cases we're talking about. Yeah, uh, not clear here with that, but he does have a second question, so we'll ask that. Uh, what could create front of neck clicking, perhaps the hyoid area on one side after trauma at the back of the neck? Thank you. Um, Say again now, um, what, what happened to the back? Yeah, what could create front of neck clicking, perhaps the hyoid area, so front of neck clicking on one side after trauma at the back of the neck? Clicking on uh, the side in the front after a posterior injury trauma is what I'm reading. Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, a number of different things. I think you're talking about clicking in the front here up top. So that could be due to some of those ligaments that are there, uh, the tectorial membrane, uh, the superficial and occipital ligament, uh, et cetera. That could also be due to injury to the longus capitis. Uh, that could be due to some of the strap mechanism uh, muscles that you were talking about there. Um, or ligaments like the stylomandibular ligament, et cetera. But usually it, it would be an upper cervical uh, ligament injury at the front, and there's lots of different ligaments there. Now realize that if it's below C1, those ligaments are routinely injected in the PICL procedure. It's, if it's above C1, those ligaments are routinely injected in the, the above C1 version of the PICL procedure. As we're, as we're coming out. All righty. Thank you, Shenzhen, for your question. Next one from Daniel Ren. Daniel asks, is there any plan to use culture-expanded cells for PICL? Would that be helpful at all? It may be helpful, although I think probably unnecessary. So for example, when it comes to ligament healing, uh, on ligaments that we can see very easily and very readily, like the ACL, where not only can we see them on MRIs because they're bigger, they're easier to image, but there's entire sequences that have been developed, for instance, to image the ACL even better than a regular MRI. And in those cases, uh, bone marrow concentrate works extremely well to, to heal that ligament. So I don't know that it's necessary. 
Um, it wouldn't be bad to have that as an option. The biggest problem, I think, is that uh, the Grand, in the Cayman Islands um, and elsewhere, the concern would just be having the medical backup uh, in order to be able to do that kind of thing. So if someone got sick from a PICL procedure or got injured from a PI, PICL procedure, and that's not something that's, that's happened to date, I'm talking about really sick and needed uh, an ICU. You know, in Grand Cayman, the best ICU on the island um, is across the island at Health City, and the best ICU above that is in Miami. So uh, that's a concern and probably the reason why we wouldn't do this procedure down in Grand Cayman. Uh, now, if in the U.S. culture expanded cells uh, became legal to use and there were people that are manufacturing high quality cells, then we would certainly consider using those cells in this type of procedure. All righty. We've got uh, plenty of questions, so you let me know when you're out of time. But uh, this one's from Megan May. Uh, can the cervical ALL be treated at all levels in an office visit? Also, can treatment be done without numbing? Um, so the cervical ALL um, can be treated. I'm not sure what you mean by an office visit. Um, those are procedures that we do in our procedure rooms. Um, so if that's what you mean by an office visit, then yes. Now, really, the very top portion of that can only really be uh, hit via the back of the throat, and that's going to be the PICL procedure. So that's going to be down to about C2 or so, uh, maybe C3. And then the rest of it would be from the front here, uh, kind of C3 and down. So two different procedures um, in order to get all of it. But from C3 down, that can be done in a non-PICL type setting. From C3 up, that would require a PICL type procedure. And can it be done without numbing? Uh, we generally don't use a lot of numbing medicine uh, for these procedures other than the skin. Uh, generally, the patients are placed under with IV. Um, so for using IV anesthesia, we don't use much numbing medicine, if, if any at all. And if your request was to use zero, then obviously that that's, would be easy to do because okay. you'd be sleeping. Right on. All right, this one's from, again, Shenzhen Khan. Is it safe to do dextrose prolotherapy in the anterior longitudinal lig ligament, C0 to C2 capsular ligaments, and the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane? No, uh, it's not. Um, a, a big concern there would be, so with the front injections, realize that the phrenic nerve is there, for example. Uh, the phrenic nerve is the nerve that helps you breathe. Uh, the vagus nerve is there. All of these nerve nerves have to be very carefully avoided. But uh, injecting 12.5% dextrose, that's neurolytic, meaning that is uh, something that can damage nerves at that concentration. So if some of that stuff were inadvertently to get on either of those nerves, you, you would have a really screwed up patient. Um, so I wouldn't recommend dextrose prolotherapy for that. Now going to the back uh, and going over those injections, uh, the PAOM, realize, is right abutting the dura, or the covering of the spinal cord, which is innervated, highly innervated. So again, if you were to reject the PAOM, which is something that has to be done under fluoroscopy guidance, using uh, uh, contrast, I mean, it can't just be done how they do it in Florida, where they take an x-ray machine and kind of stick the needle in there and hope for the best. Um, the concern would be that if you got dextrose prolotherapy onto the dura, you're going to denervate the dura, meaning that you're going to take, you're going to destroy the small nerves around the dura. Um, and while that could produce pain relief, it also could produce awful pain. So uh, the answer would be uh, that would not be a smart thing to do. All right. And, and again, you know, those facet capsules up there without using DSA, like we talked about at the beginning of this, if you were inject dextrose prolotherapy into the vertebral artery, that's a bad day for everyone. You're getting a nasty brain injury from that injection. Keep it safe. Megan May asks, what are the pros and cons of injecting upper cervical muscles? Does injecting strengthen and tighten them? 
it would tighten their tendons, not necessarily the muscle itself. So you'd, you'd want to target the tendon to try to see if you had damage or injury to those muscle tendons. And that can certainly happen sometimes. So for instance, you know, we've seen patients with upper cervical instability who are, or craniocervical instability that are extremely tender on either side of the C2 spinous process. And uh, that's where the, the many tendons insert. So we have not infrequently injected those areas to try to help those tendons heal. Excellent. All right, Shenzhen's got another one. I know that the PICL with stem cells has helped a lot of people, but can I please ask if you would ever consider doing the PICL with just PRP if someone couldn't handle the stem cell procedure? Uh, it's certainly possible to do. We'd have to have a really good reason to do it. And, and the reason why I say that is, uh, listen, when we first started doing this procedure, it was all about safety. So what I mean by that is at the end of the day, if, uh, if we were going to go in there and take the risk of doing this procedure, then we wanted to put our best foot forward, and that was bone marrow concentrate, a stem cell procedure and not PRP for ligament repair. Now, having said that, as we get more and more data on the safety of this procedure and have a better, clearer picture of what that is, how many people get serious complications? How many people get, uh, get a, a long-term flare-up from the procedure? How many people uh, get better, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, we will obviously relax our standards um, on the safety side. So you know, if we do 1,000 or 2,000 of these and we have no serious adverse event, i.e. someone ended up in the ICU um, as a result of what we did, then we'd feel much more comfortable doing PRP in there because we're now no longer concerned about the injection route itself. Um, but we're still right now going to need a very, very good reason not to put our best foot forward with ligament healing. Excellent. Excellent question. Gabby follows up with, what is your current ideal time frame to get a repeat PICL procedure? Yeah, Gabby, we're really talking about on the, at the soonest three, four months, at the latest six, eight months. And most people basically follow up with us at the three to four month mark. We then say, okay, you made enough progress from number one, you're ready for number two, and then they schedule. So they're, they're really getting these about every six months. Some people have pushed it and contracted that to get these every four months. The problem is there, some people are still flared up, and it's pretty rare, but it happens at that three, four month mark, so they never get that honeymoon period. So just realize that those are the general uh, time frames that we're seeing. All righty. Lindsay Johnson asks, do you ever do injections to stabilize a popping out hyoid bone? Stabilize a popping out hyoid bone. I think we would need to have some information, credible information, that it's popping out. Uh, certainly possible to do. The hyoid bone is kind of freely suspended in muscles and tendons and surrounded by a fascia. So all of that would be possible to do, uh, but it's not something that we've done a lot of treating uh, unstable hyoid bones. Um, so I'd, I would need to do a little bit more research on what's in the vicinity um, under ultrasound, it probably can be done because we can see that bone. We can also see it under x-ray guidance. So probably a procedure that'd be done under a combination of x-ray guidance and ultrasound. But a lot of that's going to need to be mapped out to make sure that there's nothing there that we might hurt in doing that uh, procedure. But 95% uh, certain it could be done. All righty. I'm assuming you're okay on time. We got a few more left and uh, keep yeah, up. Yeah, let's take two more just because I, I do have a yep. two o'clock I'll be able All right. to. So we got Shenzhen following up. What sort of neck problems can cause the trapezius and adjacent muscles to pull up the clavicle and shoulder up significantly above the other one? Yeah, you know, that's a super common thing. So basically when you lose the ability to stabilize with the small muscles in the neck, the big muscles take over, uh, including the scalenes, the upper traps, and, and get tight in order to try and stabilize the neck. But now, they're not built to do that, so eventually they get really, really beat up. Um, so that's, you know, 
that's a really common thing that we see. You can also see it if there's uh, uh, the elevation of the upper rib cage on that side. We can also obviously see it with scoliosis. So there's a number of different reasons. All right, I'm trying to go through and uh, get a new viewer here that uh, hasn't asked a question. We'll go with Kevin Ryan who asks, can stem cells repair a torn medial meniscus? Um, the answer is we have seen evidence of that um, on uh, MRI. So the answer is yes. I don't think it happens in everyone. A lot of it depends on where the tear is in the red zone and the red white zone and the white zone uh, and the age of the patient. And also realize that once you get middle-aged, sort of 35 or older, uh, if you have been told you have a meniscus tear on MRI, there's a real question as to whether that meniscus tear is causing your pain. And I know that freaks some people out because they believe that they got the MRI, it showed a meniscus tear, ergo we know what's causing their knee pain. But just realize that uh, that's usually not true if you're over age 35. Why? Because if we take 100 people your age, let's say you're 50, uh, who have never had a day of knee pain and we MRI their knees, about half of them are gonna have meniscus tears. So there isn't a, a direct relationship between seeing a meniscus tear on MRI and having pain. And, you know, obviously a lot of people don't want to hear that. They want to, to hear that someone has found the cause of their pain, but oftentimes that's not the case. Always, uh, not always direct linear uh, cause and effect. The body is complex, complicated, and amazing in its uh, abilities to uh, create problems and solve them all on their own. And that's really what uh, the mystery of being really sort of a Sherlock Holmes about all of this is all about. Uh, it's just not that simple. Uh, you got a lot of other questions, Doc, but I know you also have your next appointment scheduled. So maybe we will do this again, uh, potentially next week, as I know we're not here on Friday. We've got a previous engagement. Um, but let me ask you to sort of wrap up today's show before we close out. Yeah, so basically uh, we were talking about digital subtraction and geography, but that gets into the concept of requiring lots of specialized equipment to do these upper cervical and PICL injections. Um, and, you know, there's just layers upon layers of specialized equipment and knowledge needed to, to, to address this area safely. So that's probably the take home message from what we were talking about earlier on. All righty. We appreciate you joining us each and every week. As you know, Mondays we are here at the Centeno Schultz page. Fridays we're on the Regenex page. We will not be there this Friday. So we'll see you next Monday back here. My recommendation is please make sure to hit notifications so when we go live, you get notified. And two, ask your questions early, please. We want to take as many as we possibly can. I go in order as they come on in. So if you want to make sure you get your questions answered, please, please, please ask them early. Last call, make sure if you want to keep up on all this amazing information, make sure you're subscribed to Dr. Centeno's blog. You can go to regenx.com, sign up for his blog. He puts out a daily piece of something that will make you say wow about your body, about healthcare, about what's possible each and every day. I read it every day. You should too. On behalf of Dr. Chris Centeno, I'm Dr. Jason Deitch. Thank you for joining us. Please share this video and every video we create with those friends, family members, even doctors that you know should be tuning in and asking Dr. Centeno their questions directly themselves. On behalf of Dr. Centeno, I'm Dr. Jason Deitch. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next Monday right here. Until then, stay well and be kind. Thanks for watching.